Hey folks, thanks for joining me today for five tips to secure your backups. My name is Matt Crape. I am a senior technical product marketer for Veeam. And we're going to cover some things that you could be doing today to protect your backups. So we'll be touching on some stuff specific to Veeam backup and replication. But ideally, even if you're not using our product, these are things that you should be considering as part of your plans. So let's jump right into this. First thing you want to think about is locking your front door. You know, it might sound a little bit silly, but it's one of the easiest things you could do. Stop access to whether it's the management plane, stop access to anything that could really impact your uh, backups and their security. So you can use things like, for example, Veeam backup or application, you know, one-time passwords. Super simple setup. Scan the code, you're, you'll get your authenticator app going, and you're good to go. You can use it in an offline fashion too, because lots of folks like to keep their backup servers off of the internet, which you know shouldn't be internet accessible, makes things more secure by default that way. But don't just stop there. Think about every step along the way. Where else can you implement one-time passwords, MFA, and so forth? Can you implement it on the actual OS that you're running on? If you can, do that as well. Are you able to do it on any of the other components? Restrict the access to the operating system itself as well, if you can. Once things get locked down a little bit, you know, I like to say throw away the key, but not really. What I mean by this is think about things like immutability. If you're not familiar with the term, it basically prevents changes or deletions of files. Security is a big topic this year at VMware uh, Explore. And there's a reason for that. Ransomware is not going away. It's going to be a threat that keeps coming around, and more and more individuals are attacked every year. One of the first things that attackers do is they delete the backup files. Why is that? Well, because without a backup, you can't really have a successful recovery. So by introducing ways to prevent the backups from being deleted, you give yourself that added insurance, that added safety that you need when it comes to making sure that you can recover in, in, um, after an attack. But you also have to make sure that you're planning accordingly. Now what I mean by this is when you enable immutability, that means that file can't be changed and it can't be deleted. If you're using some sort of cloud storage, for example, make sure you understand how long is that data going to be sitting in that cloud and what's that cost going to be. Similarly, if you're doing something on-prem, understand, hey, what does this actually look like from a growth pr perspective? You don't want to turn on the immutability, figure, hey, you know what, we're good to keep this for three years, only to realize after three months, you're going to run out of storage. What do you do then? So make sure that you do the math. Another very common thing that we stressed is use strong, secure accounts. Many of us are familiar with the idea of service accounts. You, know, you set these accounts up, whether it's in Active Directory or maybe right within Windows itself, and they have just the permissions that they need, and you use them for a very specific scope, give it a strong password. Downside is, it's a pain to manage. Right? When it comes time to actually go through and rotate through these passwords, it, it, there's a lot of documentation that might be involved, you might have to change in many different places. Veeam supports something called Group Managed Service Accounts, which is actually an Active Directory construct. So you can use this for all sorts of stuff within your infrastructure. And what it does is it creates an automated way for these accounts to be created. Passwords are automatically rotated because they live within Active Directory. The applications, in this case like Veeam Backup or Replication, don't actually have the password, so there's nothing compromised there. And they auto rotate after 30 days. So these passwords are 240 byte characters long, which is pretty secure, automatically rotated. So it definitely adds a layer of security into the mix. Along the same lines, a lot of us are very familiar with the idea of principle of least privilege. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you give accounts, and not only accounts, but operators, just access to what they need. So that might be a little more difficult from the backup perspective because backup admins tend to require a lot of access, you know, whether, it's, whether it's for things such as performing restores or accessing systems verified data. But there's actually ways that you could empower your users as well. So the screenshot that I have here is actually from Veeam Backup Enterprise Manager. And you're able to go in there and perform tasks such as 
performing an instant VM recovery, you could delegate this out. So if you have help desk folks, for example, and you're tired of getting the tickets escalated to you as a backup admin, you can actually create accounts and they can log into the web server here and perform a recovery. You can also do things like recover file levels. You could um, restore file levels, rather. You could restore databases. You could perform instant VM recoveries. There's a lot of power within these things that you could use. But at the end of the day, you're able to really narrow it down to what they have access to, and you can provide scopes. You could maybe say, Administrator A, you can restore VMs 1, 2, and 3. Administrator B, you could do 4, 5, and 6. Or maybe there's overlap as well. So it's really about giving you that granularity that you need. Encryption. I've, I've talked about immutability, right? The ability to prevent someone from altering or deleting your data. That's only half the battle. Stuff like that doesn't prevent somebody from copying the data. So think data exfiltration. You have an attacker, he's on the network, maybe he's getting credentials somewhere, and he has access to your backup files. Is there anything to mitigate the risk of them copying it down and sharing out that data, whether with another organization, posting it online? That's really where encryption comes in, and ideally your own encryption and not some ransomware encryption. So some things to keep in mind is, first of all, know what your requirements are. Do you fall under some sort of federal regulation uh, that you have to use certain types of encryption? Right? Understand what that is. Do you have to encrypt things in rest, in flight, throughout the whole path? Figure those things out, understand where they should be implemented and how they could be implemented. From the Veeam perspective, many different ways we could do this. There are many ways that you should be doing this as well. So we can encrypt the backup itself. We can make sure that we're also encrypting the backup configuration, which is something you should be doing as part of your daily routine as well. So if you're not familiar with that, Veeam backup and replication, you're able to actually perform um, configuration backup. And what this allows you to do is restore that configuration to a different VBR server somewhere else. So say you're in a situation where you need to rebuild things in a hurry, you can spin up a template, a VM, install VBR, import your configuration, and you're back up and running. What's important to note though is when you enable encryption, you're actually able to export those encryption keys as well. So because things are encrypted, you don't need to worry about that data exfiltration in this regard either. Additionally, you also want to make sure that you're doing things, uh, once again, through Enterprise Manager. You'll see here we've got the option to um, encrypt, uh, to, sorry, export your passwords as well as part of the process, but that's only available when you're actually using encryption. So I know I've gone through a lot of these things fairly quick here, but there's actually still a lot more that's available online. So we've got Veeam University, which is a fantastic resource. You can go through there. We've got different talk tracks built out. You're able to do things, whether you're brand new to Veeam or trying to learn more. Lots of things to do there, and it's a mix of you know, self-paced videos as well, and you'll be able to find some of the key things that we do from the product perspective to really help you get up and running. We've also got the Veeam YouTube channel, which has lots and lots and lots of content on there. We try to keep that fairly up to date as well. We're always posting new stuff. Look for a local Veeam user group as well. We've got the short URL down there. User groups all over the world, and they're not all necessarily just in person. They are also virtual as well, so lots of accessibility there. And lastly, we've got the 1111 Hands-On Labs. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with the Veeam, uh, sorry, the VMware Hands-On Labs. These are very similar. So you can actually go in there, it's a live environment. You, you can start spinning things up. We've got scripts to walk you through. What is it that you're doing? Is this an installing configuration? Are you setting up jobs? We've also recently launched a new ransomware hands-on lab as well that takes you through the entire Veeam data platform to perform recoveries. So that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Uh, you can find me at the Veeam booth. I'll be there as well. And if you need anything else, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.